Karen, I you had my, my microphone on mute. <laughs> you, so you were saying your staff were t was talking about Hack Mankind? Hack, Hack Mankind and how some of them have logged on and what they're gaining from it. They're loving the exercise and the uh, spirituality. And those are the, the major ones they spoke of. Yeah. Yes, 100%. So we do have, so Karen uh, is our panelist on education and kids on every Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern time, but it's true, like you're, you were saying, your team was talking about um, spirituality, and we have health hacks and legal hacks, and we have different subjects. So, anything from business, legal, spirituality, health and fitness, um, education and kids, and you also have relationships and um, mindsets and motivation. So those are all our panel calls, one a week, one a day, every single day of the week. And we also have our support calls in order to implement what you will be um, hearing today. So right after this call at noon, you will be able to implement whatever Karen is sharing with us and see like, what are your concerns, your thoughts? So head on over to www.hackmankind.com if you haven't done so yet. We have our first thousand members free of access. So let's get right onto it, Karen. Yeah. So tell yeah. me what is your current hack that you've been talking about this week? Uh, humor, humor. I think, uh, and we talked about this a little bit, I believe last week, but I think now it's becoming more critical. Uh, what I'm seeing is a trend toward um, heavier hearts and minds as we realize that we are still quarantined and we are not seeing the end. We're not hearing the end, we're not seeing the end. Um, I think people are really kind of in a mindset of, okay, I did it, that was fun. Can we stop now? <laughs> and um, <clears throat> the novelty is worn off for children. And certainly if it was novel for parents and teachers, that's long gone. And, uh, and people are, the people who are on the, the front lines in education and, and working with children, so the teachers and parents, uh, therapists and, and such, are, are having, are experiencing some burnout. Uh, and they've been holding people up, but who's holding them up? So remembering humor, uh, a joke, a uh, jib jab, uh, something that makes people smile is essential right now. I love that. So humor and making people smile. So how can you add humor? Do you have little tips and tricks? Like what are some examples that you can give to us? I think it's important to allow yourself to be silly. I think we're very um, buttoned up. We tend not to be silly. And I think it's important to allow yourself to be silly. So joining a Zoom call with a funny hat or silly hair or, you know, a fake mustache or something of that sort, uh, people seem to have fun with that. Inviting jokes at a meeting uh, is fun. As I mentioned, uh, jib jab yesterday, I made a jib jab and during my faculty meeting, I played it for everyone. We got a good many laughs out of that and it was shared wide and far and wide. Um, it's just, just in a moment, you know, I do this thing and I, I'm, not everybody can do this, I suppose, but I will sit in a crowd and I'll just start laughing. And people will look like, what is she laughing about? What is that about? But over time, it's contagious. And before you know it, you can get a whole room to laugh about absolutely nothing. And then they're laughing because people are laughing, you know, and that's funny. And so it sounds silly. And if you have an inhibition, it feels silly. But if you just let yourself do it, you'd be amazed at how contagious a laughter, laughter is. A hundred percent. And the, the, you laugh at the small things and then start getting used to laughing and it becomes more natural, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. As I was getting ready for this today, and my husband knows 11 o'clock every Thursday, I'm going to be on air live and the house has to be quiet. And 10 minutes before he took out the vacuum. I kid you not, took out the vacuum. <laughs> The dog barks at the vacuum. So now the dog is barking, the vacuum's going, it's central vacuum, you can hear it through the whole house. And 
I thought to myself, I could scream at him right now because that's like what I felt, right? I was like, come on, dude, like, what are you doing? Or I can make laughter out of it. And so I made light of it and we both laughed about it. And, and he was like, oh, okay, I, I know, I know. I, silly me, you know? And it just, it passed in a lighter fashion. We could have had a real brouhaha over it. But be, I guess because I'm in the mindset of humor, I thought, how can I bring humor to this? And it, it certainly helped. And then he said, okay, I'm gonna to go to the office. <laughs> Give you well, that what house. did you say? How did you bring humor? I, I, it's good. just, you know, more, more of what is those inside jokes for us, you know, like, I don't even remember what I said, but you know, you have those, those moments with your partner, uh, with your children that sort of, you know, how to make each other laugh. He just I love came that. <laughs> I love that. So bringing, so bringing humor into what we're doing, especially right now, I totally feel that. I'm like, okay, I can do a few weeks. I can do a month in, in, in quarantine. And, and I, I feel it. I hear it as well. It's like, all right, we're, we're good now. We want to go back to, <laughs> to being yeah. able. And, and so bringing humor is a great hack amazing so if you have any questions at any time for karen either if you're on the zoom call you can go in the q a um, section at the bottom of your screen and if you're joining us on facebook live you can also add your questions on the comments all righty so let's continue Jessica, i'm sorry I, I hate to do this but i i need a moment because he's back <laughs> hold on one second <laughs> that's all right all right so I, I'm assuming he's back means the dog is back or the vacuum is back on, which is definitely very humorous. So one of the things that Karen was sharing is bringing humor. Oh, if you're happy to challenge on how to do it, if you join us on our next call at noon, we'll be able to brainstorm specifics in accordance to your um, situation. So welcome back, Karen. <laughs> well, I'll deliver a challenge on the angel call, bring humor to it. Enter in with a joke, enter in with something silly and see, see how that resonates. Um, the angel calls are a great place to do that. What a wonderful place to share and be vulnerable. I love that. Yeah. And so this brings me, maybe you can help us with even linking to uh, um, humor. One of the things that um, I heard in one of the questions that I was um, asked to ask you on this call um, is so it kind of go like this. My daughter is a 13 years old and she's at home. Um, she has her, her schooling uh, virtually, but the rest of the time, all she does is spend time on her phone. So I guess the equivalent would be video games, phone, TV, Netflix, all of that glued to the screen and does not want to participate doing puzzles or any other activity that you know, a parent would consider a little better. Mm. What's mm. your recommendation? First of all, it's asking the child what the child would consider. So we may have some notions where you may bring, we may remember that our child used to enjoy making puzzles, used to enjoy painting with watercolors, uh, remembering a time when you did collage with your child or you read a good book with your child. Um, so then we think we can, re, we can uh, recreate those moments, but remember that every situation, the child has grown and, and maybe watercolors aren't exciting anymore. Maybe a puzzle isn't the thing to do. Uh, one of the things that I have found uh, is working very well with um, teenagers is sharing movies. So um, I see lots of families uh, sharing, you know, their favorite movies from the 1980s and 1990s and uh, sitting around watching these movies. Uh, tends to bring some bonding. And then maybe around the movie is we'll bake cookies or we'll make popcorn or um, some other favorite family snack. Uh, that seems to draw the kids out and, and allow them to make fun of you because most of these movies are ridiculous. And um, they find they find it in that, you know, you liked that, How, I don't get it, or that's so silly, or, um, but often it's, it seems to be bonding people, uh, young and old together. Uh, so I think that's a good, a good way to do it. I've seen um, some families um, sharing their screen and watching movies together with family members and friends that are in other homes. So sometimes you might say to your child, hey, let's bring your friend, you know, 
John to the to to our movie night tonight, and we'll share our screen, and that often then feels more aligned with what children want to do, which is to be close to their friends, uh, and so that that may work. The other thing that has been working is, um, you know, the impromptu uh, book reading. Uh, snuggling up and reading a book. It's funny, but teens will still do that. They won't get close to you in most any situation, but if you bring out the right book, they may snuggle up and read a book with you. Uh, so that's something I've seen people use successfully. I think it's, it's a conversation too. It's a conversation around, it is concerning me that you are huddled in your corner of the house with your technology and we miss you. We miss you because that's what it comes down to. You miss your child. Beyond I'm concerned and you should have more fresh air and the screen is bad for your eyes and all those other things is we miss you. We miss you, we wanna do something with you. So could you give us some time each day and at what time would that work? And let's make a list of the types of things we'd like to share and do together. So it's, it's planning, it's not just throwing it upon someone. <laughs> I love that. And I love your approach on, on one of the things that's reoccurring on our calls with you is that you utilize and it's, it's like an all encompassing uh, activity where we're all participating in the creativity of finding what we want to be doing. What are the creative ideas of finding, I wouldn't say solutions because it implies there's a problem, but mm -hmm. you, you know uh, what I, what I mean. So, that is an uh, incredible thing to just keep highlighting is just talk about it, be honest and vulnerable about it, and bring an element of fun to it. So right. it doesn't all need to be serious. I love that. So yeah. we have a couple I, of questions. I love that you're using the word vulnerable because in my mind, I think it's very important for the parent to, to or the caregiver to be vulnerable. You know, the saying, I miss you, or I need you, or I'm feeling, empty and and you help me you know fill my tank can you please spend some time with me i think that's then the child knows you're coming from an authentic place a hundred percent yeah and sometimes it takes courage it, it, it's it's yeah. not easy to go there yeah yeah so it's it's a practice start with the small things and then build on top of that yes. thank you so much karen so we have a couple questions coming in, so I'll, I'll grab some of those. So we have Richard, hi Richard. Uh, mm -hmm. The skillful ed educator makes sure they have the trust of the students before they bring it into the conversation. How do you build that trust? Hmm. So tr I think, I know, you build trust by being, as I said, authentic and approaching uh, children with integrity. Uh, it's important to, to be sure that you're being honest, that you're being um, sincere in your connections, and that you are wanting to know them. So one of the things that I've noticed as I'm checking into our live online classes is that our teachers know our children in the sense that they're asking them questions about their pets, about their stuffed toys, about something they see in their room, about the space in which they're studying, about how they're feeling. How are you feeling? What are you doing? Um, is this a good day? Is this a hard day? How can we help? Um, but before doing all of those things, to truly get those honest answers, you do have to build this degree of trust. Uh, and if you see children as powerful, resourceful, and competent, if you see them as, as people with rights now, then you will build trust with them uh, rather than to see them as something that is my, my keep, my responsibility, something to be protected and sheltered and all the kinds of things that we more traditionally hear people say about children uh, is to see them as people in their own right. And, and to let them feel that. So, it, so it's all encompassing. So it's a whole child, it's heart, hands, mind, right? It's a whole child. So making sure that it isn't just the intellectual piece that you're diving into, but you're diving into the heart, you're diving into the spirit and mind. Uh, and when you do that, they will return with the same degree of interest and respect. And then you've got trust. 
I love that. And, and to, to build on that, we have a follow-up question, which is around humor, right? That your hack of yeah. today. Um, humor only uh, works only when there is a trust relationship between teacher and student. Can you use humor to build relationship or do you need to have trust first? I think it depends on the child. And I think, and it depends on, to some degree on the individual. If you are, if you come in with humor, let's say you come in with, there's a difference between humor and sarcasm. Not everybody makes that differentiation. So if you come in with sarcasm, your style is to be sarcastic. Nine times out of 10, particularly with young, uh, young adults, you will turn them off instantly. They don't get it. They don't feel like it's nice or kind or caring. So I would say when you're building trust to set aside the sarcasm for when you have that trust and they get to know you and they, they understand sort of your rhythm and your ways of delivery. So initially it's to build trust and you can build trust around humor because some children come from that place. You have to know that, right? Uh, so yes and no. Yes, you can use humor, but you have to know when and you have to know how and you have to be certain that it's not sarcasm. I love that distinction of sarcasm and humor. Um, can you give us an example? Maybe on the spot. <laughs> yeah, um, I, you know, I, mm, that's a tough one because I, sarcasm doesn't come to me naturally. Um, but, you know, I've seen teachers kind of, uh, be quick with a child, like about something they're wearing or something they're, um, you know, a way in which maybe they walk or talk or, you know, maybe mimicking, right? So you've seen, I've seen teachers who will mimic a child and they do it from a place of, I mean, not always, but for, men, for some people, they're doing it from a place of honesty and trying to connect. But it's so, in, the, this is an ingrained thing. In, characteristic of this person. And so to be sarcastic about that in that moment before you've built this trust and relationship is going to fall hard. <laughs> and maybe the damage done will be too deep to then be able to build the trust you need to build. So, so it's, a, it's, it's a fine line. Um, and because it's a fine line, I say, err on the side of caution, don't use sarcasm. And it can be silly in different ways. Like you're saying, you know, wear the fun, like funny ears or the little, like, I've got these, like, the, these little hearts that like bounce up and down. Yeah. Or, yep. or the goofy goggles that like sparkle. Yeah. And that's fun. It's yeah. humorous, you would say, but definitely not. Yeah. We, had a, we had a teacher last week who every day had a theme to her lunch. And so she had a crazy hair day. She had a puppet day. Um, don't remember what the others were, but she was sure to do it as well. So it wasn't okay, let's have a crazy hair day and then she shows up without a crazy hair day or let's make puppets and she didn't take the time to make a puppet, she did, she did those things. So that's the other thing is moving in parallel with children uh, through humor is important. That's a great idea for even at home. You could mm -hmm. have a theme day where it's just crazy hair day and the whole family's got crazy hair. Yeah. And I can even see myself one day, I mean, if I had children coming onto one of these calls, like, guys, sorry, today's crazy hair day and I got my crazy hair on. Yeah. And yeah. even at business meetings, you can do that and add a little element mm -hmm. and inspire others to do the same of having that fun at home. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. What I saw was that a few children did not come with their crazy hair, but when they saw the teacher had it, they were like, oh, wait a minute. And they went running and they got something that probably was quite nearby. And they had some doubt about whether to wear it or not wear it. And the teacher kind of gave them the entree, the invitation. I'm going to be silly. We can all be silly together. I love that. And the, the questions keep pouring in. So I'm going to continue feeding these questions. Thank you so much for um, posting the questions on the Q&A on the Zoom. If you are watching us on Facebook, feel free to also ask your questions on the comment section. So um, also on the educator side, Karen, educators get consumed with curriculum, uh, policy, procedures, et cetera. How can you build a professional development opportunity for teachers so that they can build their skill with humor. I think, I, well, it just has to be a theme like any other professional development theme. So, uh, you know, so 
education with humor education uh you know for me it would be more like a a holistic education that incorporates humor something of that sort and i i clearly believe i mean there's science behind it so you can study the science behind it because oftentimes teachers are questioned you know why are you doing what you're doing it's not in the regulations it's not in the policy it's not in the standards um why are you doing it so i think uh bolstering teachers with the underlying research and content uh is important so in a in a in a professional development program around using he humor in the classroom i would be sure to to have that i'd be sure to have different perspectives from different speakers because what the way i may approach humor will be different the way than the way you might approach humor neither one is wrong necessarily just different and so it helps the teachers to see a variety of ways in which it can be done uh building in the the repartee so how you exchange ideas with children in, in particular in this case humor but any ideas so if you were to discuss that and you were to address that then that could carry over into all of your teaching uh methodology um you know for some people it's just smiling smiling and be lighthearted and and ready to walk into that room uh, and be present, be present and decide how you want to be present before you walk into the room. You know, it's interesting and, and somehow this connects with me. So if anybody's been watching Ed, Ed Lay does this um, piece where he, he has, he addresses a lymphatic system and he has you do some tapping through your body and then bouncing. And I've been using this when I feel heavy uh, and, and so for me, it lightens the load. And then I, I feel like I can be more myself, the authentic person I want to be. Uh, and so as a hack, that was a great hack for me. Uh, but, but what it leads me to say is there are times when you don't feel, you don't feel like you want to be funny. You don't feel funny. You don't feel humorous. You don't, you don't feel those things that you need to feel to come to walk into that classroom or to walk into the house from work or to walk out of your bedroom from, from, you know, a night's sleep. You just don't feel it. And I think you have to find what is right for you to lighten the load so that you can, so that you can feel it. And I think the other thing is that if you can't lighten the load, then it's a matter of figuring out who within your circle can help you. Because that may be a day that you need some help. Mm, yes, calling a friend, putting some music on, the yeah. music, or, or, or using Ed's uh, tricks. I'm so glad you brought um, Ed up. So Ed is our um, fitness and health panel expert who not only does our panel calls on Tuesdays, um, he also does every single day during the week at 7.30 a.m. a fitness hack. And usually it is, like you were saying, Kara, like the lymphatic system, lymphatic system pressure points in our body. It's incredible. Like we do a couple things and I become more flexible all of a sudden. It's just, I, I it's and with a lot of knowledge and background. And yeah, yeah so, and, and it does impact all other areas of our life, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. And then I, while you were talking, Karen, I've had a thought. I was talking yesterday to some family back home in Portugal, and um, my my cousin, um, it was her birthday yesterday. Happy birthday, Vitória, if you're watching. <laughs> <laughs> and um, she has been, my aunt was telling me or, uh, that since early in the morning, like 8.30 a.m., they've got classes online and she had just finished it was like 6 p.m mm. and it was really intense and so certain so certain things the parents feel like wow it's, it's like it's a lot and then the, the child is my husband, like, tired and they don't they're so i guess my question is how do they communicate that to the teachers respectfully but also say you know like you guys you guys need to take it easy or give them stuff because a lot of the work that they're doing that the parents also need to be doing so right. that they do well. Like they're learning right. how to do PowerPoint and a lot of their homework is all in PowerPoint. And, and her dad was just like, oh yeah, half of the time I have to finish it. Yeah. And that's just all the other parents because otherwise she looks like she didn't do a good job and then all the kids did. So mm -hmm. what's your advice in talking to teachers and expressing this in a respectful manner? Because you, are, I do feel at least back home in Portugal, it's very set in the way. It's like, this is right. how it is. 
right? And these are the rules. So how do you talk right. to people right. out there? So, so first of all, I think it's what we all need to realize. And, uh, you know, we, we use the term stakeholders. So who are the stakeholders in your child's education? right? It's the child, it's the parent, it's the teacher, it's the principal, the vice principal, the superintendent, the, the director of student um, uh, services. There's a lot of people who are part of the group, the stakeholders, as we like to say in education. And um, helping, I think the first way to do it is to try and help your child to communicate how he or she is feeling. Not every teacher will be responsive to that. And in fact, some teachers will, will, will bristle to that. Um, but what you're really doing is you're teaching your child how to use their voice. And that will be something that will come in handy the rest of their lives. Uh, beyond that, the, the parent needs not to feel intimidated. Like, especially when you're in a school system where things are quite traditional. Um, it is important to be able to say to your school, the teacher initially, I think, uh, and then moving beyond if you must, uh, to say to your school, this, these are not ordinary times. These are not typical circumstances. Um, there's so much more at play here in terms of what we know in our home, what we can access in our home, what we as parents have as responsibility, the number of children we're teaching in our home, right? So often there's multiple siblings at different grades doing different things. Maybe you're sharing equipment, maybe you're, you know, who knows, maybe your Wi-Fi doesn't, doesn't handle all of you being on at the same time. Maybe your data plan doesn't allow for you to bring in all the JPEGs and all the PDFs. Um, there's so many facets here. So I think, what I would love to see is a parent that either writes a letter or writes or calls in for, for you know, a, a conversation, um, whether it's on Zoom or by phone, uh, to, to explain from a, from a very humanistic position what this looks like in, in their home. You know, these, these are the challenges in my home. As parents, this is what we can support. This is what we can't support. This is what we think is healthy for our children. And so therefore, you know, it might be, you know what, my child is going to, to be online two hours a day instead of four hours a day. So what are the two most important hours that my child has to be online? So then it, it, it has the inference of teamwork. Rather than coming at the teacher with this is wrong and this is wrong and this is wrong and this is wrong and you better change it. It's here's what my struggles are I imagine you also have struggles. How can we make this work for both of us, but most importantly for the child? Because the long-term effect of this you know, period of life, this historical moment uh, is vitally important. Children are either gonna come out stronger or they're gonna come out with more sort of pieces missing, might you say. And how we as adults orchestrate uh, the world around them is vitally important. Uh, and I think then if you've done and you've taken the steps that you need to take and you haven't gotten the attention you need and you haven't gotten the changes that you need, you just have to have the courage to make them. You make them. And you just say to, to the school system, this was what worked for me, for my family, for my child, for my child's health, overall health, and for our family's overall health. They are now in, as I have said in these calls before, they are now in my school, uh, in my classroom. I am the teacher and I am making decisions because I'm there every day. A hundred percent. And I, I thank you so much for that. And I'll definitely relay if they're not on, on live on Facebook, she usually is though. So <laughs> I'll relay it to my aunt. Um, and the, the thing that you mentioned is that these are not usual times. And, um, and you talk about, the, about this historical time. What do you think as parents that um, we should be focusing on that, as, that is most important right now? Family, family, family connections, heart, head, mind, spirit. That's, that's the most important thing right now. Children are learning. I, you know, 
I'm on a call every morning at 7.30 in the morning with educators who are really thoughtful, um, fabulous people. And every day we come back to this concept of heart, mind, spirit, uh, that these are important and that the skills that children are learning now, they may not be, and it, it depends, but they may not be accelerating the way we wanted them to accelerate in math or in reading uh, or in articulation or in writing, um, but they are accelerating in different ways. We're asking them to draw on, on skills that uh, maybe are not measurable. Again, the kinds of skills that are referred to as soft skills, uh, you know, rigor and endurance and, and uh, stamina and empathy and, and innovation and drive. I mean, I can go on, the list could go on and on and on and on, right? Problem solving, critical thinking, collaboration. Um, these are things that will carry them through a lifetime. And if they can do this now, if they can master some of these skills now, they carry them forward with them. And all of the other things, the reading, the writing, the math, the articulation, all the academics will come in time. Um, I think there was a study done when, um, when Katrina hit and so many children were out of school for so long, uh, a study was done. And you might, in, initially there was what, what educators like to call the slide, the summer slide, the Katrina slide, we'll hear about the Corona slide. Um, but over time, over a very short period of time, I think it's probably, I'll have to find the research, but I think it's probably over about an eight month period of time uh, and for, on average, and for some it took a little bit longer, they caught up. They caught up to where they needed to be. Uh, it wasn't the most dreadful and horrible thing uh, that, that uh, everyone imagined it would be. Um, and this will be the same. And I think if we give credit to the other skills that, that children learn and need in life, absolutely essential to the success of our, of our uh, world, um, we wouldn't be so worried. We wouldn't be so worried. Yeah. So one of the questions that pops up uh, in regards to that, so you're, we're practicing our soft skills, we're practicing, you know, endurance and flexibility and yeah. all these incredible uh, skills. And my, the thing in my head went, what about social skills? You know, what about the skills you learn in the playground between kids, yeah. where now everybody's just at home isolated? What's the impact on social skills and how can we min minimize it if there are, is an impact? Well, we're still being social, right? We're still being social in different ways. Um, so for some children, they're still being social with their friends in these Zoom calls and figuring out who talks and who listens and how to acknowledge each other and how to, um, to connect with each other. Um, in our homes, we're still being social in, in the exchanges that we have. Uh, I don't think we need to worry about social skills necessarily. Uh, I think that, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't, it doesn't, it doesn't alarm me. What I, what I think is that there's the social emotional person. And when you talk about social emotional learning, I think that we have to be thoughtful. I, we must be thoughtful. We must sit with it a little bit and, and, and consider the children uh, who are in our company, whether it be Zoom calls or whether it be in our homes, um, and how are they doing social emotionally? So one of the things that we're experiencing, and, and I think this is true across the board with educators, as I mentioned earlier, is kids are getting fatigued. They're, they're really getting fatigued. Um, they just want to get back to school. They want to get back to their friends. They want to get back into the playground. They want to go to the beach. They want to take a, you know, they want to take a hike with people. They want to be in social situations and they are becoming quite fatigued. And this is a period of time where we must carefully watch and listen because the social emotional, there's a social emotional challenge here. Um, and sometimes it's in the kids who seem like they've got it all together and everything looks good. 
they're at their computer, they're doing their schoolwork, they they come to the dinner table, they, you know, they do all the things that you want them to do, but there's a little something that's off. You know, as a parent, as a as a caregiver to children, uh, even to to anyone, you have that gut feeling, something feels off here. You're probably right. And you probably have to pursue that a little bit further. So someone said this morning, um, in talking to children, ask three times. And I thought it was a good question. So child tells you a story and you say, and so, and you wait. And they tell you a little bit more and you say, and so, and you wait. And you do that three times and you probably, probably it will reveal something beyond what you thought. You thought you had an answer the first time, right? But if you wait, you know, and, and it doesn't have to be, and so it could be, so what did that mean? Or how did that feel? And so how did that feel? And so how did that feel? And you'll be surprised that it's like peeling back an onion, you'll see more and more of the core uh, of the, uh, the emotion, the feeling. Uh, and I think we need to be smart about this. We, I'm gonna stop saying I think, I know we need to be smart about this and we need to, um, to get it done. Mm -hmm. So when I think about the social aspects of children, it's that social emotional vulnerability that we need to tap into. And then I love the, the analogy of pulling back the onions and that, that hack of asking mm -hmm. three times. Yeah. And it kind of ties into something you had said on one of our previous calls is sometimes we assume what they mean and mm -hmm. we go off on the answer and not all an explanation when really it's something very simple and small and you don't need to go there. You don't need yeah. to go to that depth. Yeah. Can you like, remind us a little about that? With your teens, you'll say, with your teens, you'll, you'll say, tell, you know, tell me more and, or I don't understand. So the teen will tell you, so you go, I don't understand, like, oh, forget it, forget it. I, you, you, you're just never going to understand, right? So what if instead of saying, I don't understand, you'd say, tell me more. What would that, how would that land? It might land in a better way tell me more, now I'm saying I'm interested instead of I don't understand, which sounds like they've done something wrong because they haven't told you in a way that you can understand. I absolutely love that hack. Tell me more, I, I, yeah, I, I did that all the time. I even still do it with my mom and I'm not even uh -huh. a teen. He's like, yeah. oh, you just, I don't have time to explain type of thing. Like I right. just did it, right? right. And yeah. but if she goes, tell me more, I'm like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> 100%. 100%. Right. I yeah. love that. You're showing I interest that. in you and in your story. Tell me more. You know, life is storytelling. It is storytelling. So tell me your story and tell me more and tell me more. Amazing. Oh, incredible. I'm just, I keep taking notes. I have a whole page for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I see the time's passing by and we have another question. Thank you so much for posting these questions. And if you have any questions after our call and you're listening to this as a recording, please feel free to post your uh, questions in the comments below and we will have a look at them for our next call next week. So we're always here to support you and make sure to tune in every week, Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern time to um, be here with her and have her answer all your questions and support you with everything related to childcare education. So another question is, so your school is progressive and truly child-centered and learner-centered. How has this philosophy made it easier for you to transition this into this new remote learning par uh, paradigm? Yes, we were ready. We were yes, ready. <laughs> Paradigm. Yes, we were, we were ready um, in the sense that we are child centered. We are driven by children's interests. We know our children. Uh, we know our families. Uh, so when we transitioned, it wasn't, there wasn't a, um, now I've got to get to know you necessarily. It was okay. I know you. 
And our curriculum also is very fluid. So our curriculum is on a continuum until we're done with that subject. And everything that we're teaching, as I mentioned earlier, the reading, writing, the mathematics, the articulation, all of those things that we're teaching, social studies, um, art and music, and we, we were able to continue. It was as if we moved the school, not that we closed the school. Uh, the children in our school are, are well connected. We, uh, in our rooms, we do a lot of work around getting to know each other. So, and, and outside of our rooms, we get to know each other. So we have whole school community meetings. We have high schoolers who go down into the preschool and toddler room and, and play with the children. Uh, all of our children are out in the yard at recess and they interact with each other. Everybody knows everybody's name. Um, and, and, and some of their stories, certainly. We'll take walks in the woods together. We'll climb. We hike the Appalachian Trail every year as a whole school. So there are things that we do that bring us together to know each other. So we know our students. And as we transitioned, it was just happy to see, you know, it was happy to see each other. So we closed, I believe, on um, the 13th of March. And uh, we opened four days later online. So it took us very little time. This is the other aspect. First of all, we're fortunate. All of our children have their own iPad. So those were taken home. Uh, every child was sent home, uh, particularly in the younger grades, with 10 books that were picked for them by their teacher. Uh, they were sent home with art supplies um, and any other tools and things that they needed. The teachers took home with them the types of things that they depend upon in their classroom they took home with them. So we have a great story about a preschool teacher took home uh, what's called Ozobots. So Ozobots are, it's a, it's a, apparatus it's like almost like a toy it looks like a little mini ball that moves around on a flat on a flat surface um, but it's computer coding and she'd been using it with her preschoolers she took them home and then she built curriculum around the ozobots it's everything from you know they were little people and they were on a trail in a town to they followed the letters of the voyager's name and all kinds of things like we 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 are always ahead of the curve we're always thinking anything is possible. We're always planning. So we came together as a staff. We brainstormed everything we could think of. We then went off and we prepared for the children. We came back and said, okay, this is what we prepared. Oh, that's a great idea. I'll do that for my kids as well. So there's a lot of collegial work that goes on in our school. And so the children had everything that they needed uh, and the teachers had everything they needed to take this step. Also in terms of technology, we're pretty advanced in technology. Every child has an iPad. Um, so those those were there and we had we we're able to push apps onto those iPads so we could push everything that they needed. And even now, if they're asking for a new app and we think it's appropriate, we'll push it to their iPad. Uh, so we were just ready. But I think the most important thing is the knowing. We know we know our children and our children know us and we have we have built relationships. We have built relationships with our parents. I know a lot of teachers who are not going online because they don't think they don't they think it's an invasion of privacy for somebody to see them in their house and they may even think it's an invasion of privacy to ask a child to show him him or herself themselves on camera and so they're not seeing each other and so in some cases they're not even going online that hurts my heart that hurts my heart because you've got to see eye to eye right there's so much that's communicated when we see each other and if you don't have that piece, you're missing a very, very significant touch point in a sense. And it, it troubles me. Um, but yes, we were quite ready. I'm quite proud of what's gone on. We have a faculty meeting every day at the end of the day just to get together and say, how are you? What's happening? Any students you're concerned about? Any ideas you want to kick around? Because, you know, we see each other in the school and we, we're constantly, oh, wow, that's a great idea. Or, oh, you know, or I'm having a problem. What do you think? How do you hear this? What do you see? And so we're missing that piece. We try and recreate it in our staff meetings. We've got parent meetings. I mean, I could go on and on about how connected this school uh, and this community of people are. It's, it's pretty amazing. I love that. And thank you so much for sharing because it made me think like, if um, certain people that are watching us aren't lucky enough to have that their children in your school or in that kind of environment, it made me think, you know, what's another way? And I'm thinking like group parent groups, 
right? Parents oh, yeah. can get together and have yeah. those meetings. It's like, yeah. how did today go? What can we do? What yeah. did you do? What did you see worked? What did you see didn't work? It doesn't necessarily need to be every single day or for some groups it could, but it could be yeah. like every three days or every week or whatever it is yeah. and really brainstorm and help each other. Um, through that. Exam the example you gave of your family, if there were parent meetings, that problem might not be a singular problem, only their problem, right? That challenge could be a challenge that lots of parents are facing. And collectively, they can either brainstorm and figure out how to solve it, or they can collectively express to the school that we are having a problem. And what would be even better is imagine that, that group of parents meeting and a teacher coming into that meeting to hear. Not to be, you know, to be a part of the conversation, not to be spoken at or to, but to be a part of the conversation. That's why I believe that our school is so successful. It's because we have these open conversations with, as I said, the stakeholders, which, which is, you know, the, the language of education, uh, the parents that, you know, I go into them uh, oftentimes. And sometimes I have meetings just with the students. I ask the teachers not to come. I have meetings with the students. It's really fun. <laughs> I love that. And another thing I'd love to highlight that you mentioned that sounds, you know, so crucial for those who are watching. And if you're feeling con self-conscious of being on camera or having your child on camera and all the background. And I feel like today is the, the really the only time where we can all be excused. Right now, I'm in the middle of moving. For those who have joined us on, on Zoom, my background, ain't, it isn't that great. I mean, I still <laughs> manage to have it all white and make it, you know, pretty, but I can't promise for the next few days I'll be traveling. <laughs> so it'll be interesting. And because we may have the tendency of going, oh, let me shut the camera off. Let me just do audio. Or let me not even come online because I don't want to have that invasion of privacy. Or even, you know, I feel maybe ashamed of what it looks like. And for you to be telling me or telling us how crucial it is to have that connection for our children it was an incredible reminder and we have to let go shed that ego side and really yeah. look at what matters most and yeah. it feels like it really matters most it's not the background it's not what it looks like it's not that we're all home we're all going to be excused every nobody's right. going to be right. judging what we look like even right. i right i'm in new york city i watch the news sometimes and you have the journalist there at home Poor lighting, poor background. <laughs> no one <Yeah>. cares. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, here's a little hack, right? You can go to your stop where it says stop video and there's a little little arrow and you can choose a virtual background. So I can do this. Oh, look at you. <laughs> so if somebody's feeling self-conscious about their background, this is a way that you can solve that problem. I so love that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. I'm going to be up in space. I feel there playful you today. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> so I think it's good to remember children love these because when you move and it doesn't work with all of them as well. Here, I'll show you. This is, this is what was happening yesterday with one of our students. So he chose a background and he chose this background. And when you move in this background, he was disappearing. I don't know how it was working, but he was disappearing. So you'd see just his belly or his head would be gone or his whole body would be gone. And we were having a good old time with that. So if you feel self-conscious, uh, it's here for you to, and then you can just go back and you can just say none. And there you go. You're back to your, back to your environment. So there's another little hack. I love that. Hack. How playful. <laughs> Choose virtual background, none. There we go. So that's yeah. a nice little hat right there and then. Thank you so much, Karen. You're I've welcome. had such fun with you today. Lots of hacks and insights. You always, as always, always an incredible call that we have with you. Um, so much value. Thank you so much for what you're doing. Sure. Thank you for all the teachers out there listening to us. Um, part of Hack Mankind's mission is to support um, everybody but also um our first time responders and frontline responders so we have um, made a commitment to have free access to all teachers um so teachers emts nurses doctors uh, firefighters and police officers you will have lifetime free access at any point to hackmankind.com so head on over there we want that's our little piece of saying thank you for what you're doing we're very grateful 
super grateful for being here uh, with you, Karen. Any final thoughts before we wrap up? Uh, just, I appreciate having everyone here. The more questions, the merrier. So please keep bringing them. Uh, and if it's lunchtime for you or breakfast time for you or just time to relax, I really suggest that you go to the angel calls. They are, um, you're, you're, you're in the company of some really thoughtful uh, people and you get to share and brainstorm. And so uh, go on over to, to the angel call. I don't know, can you put the link here for people? Uh, we can put the link here. That's a great idea. So I'll pull up the, the links right now. And our angel calls are our support calls. Every day at noon, we have our support calls where you can implement our hack of the day, implement what is being um, spoken about during our panel calls, or even just come in and, and share. Do you have any frustration at the moment? Is there... Um, something that you'd like to to discuss and chat about it really um, you you can really I'm sorry I'm just multitasking here and grabbing the link. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm giving you the link right I'm here. also but, noticing that there's a question that we didn't answer and I'd love the opportunity to answer it if people have the patience for one more con one more thought um, I am uh, I am working on an initiative in New Jersey to be sure that every student has uh, Wi-Fi and technology to access education. Uh, there's, a, there's a statistic, 40% of students in New Jersey are not accessing an education. And in many of those cases, and in the majority of those cases, it's because they don't have what they need. They don't have access to internet and they don't have access to technology. And some people have asked me, why would you do that? You have a nonprofit school, your focus should be there, you should be raising money for your school, and they're probably right. But for me, my what drives me are is what drives me is giving a meaningful education to all children everywhere. And it it is making me uh, very upset that these children don't have what they need. And um, I'm inspired by a movement, uh, Crossroads Education in Indianapolis has done this and they're doing it with a great deal of success. And so I use them as my model. And uh, in fact, after this call, unfortunately, I won't be on the angel call because I am talking to somebody who will hopefully help me make this happen. Uh, but, but what I think needs to be understood is that beyond being an educator, I am, um, a global person who who sees the world um, as a place where every individual has the human rights and uh, one of them being the right to a meaningful education, not just an education, a meaningful education, an education that improves their life. Uh, and so I'm moved to, to do this. So if anybody wants to know more, if anybody wants to join me, if anybody has access to something that might help me get this done, please let me know. And I would encourage you to do it in your communities. Do it in your communities. There are too many children who are disconnected. And so how can we reach you if we would like to, to discuss that with you? Yeah, so um, I am at uh, director at voyagerscommunityschool.org. That's the school. Um, you can find our website, voyagerscommunityschool.org, and you can reach me there. Um, I do have a link tree, so if you go to link tree and just put in Karen Jaffray, you'll find all of my, all of my, uh, all the ways in which you can reach me. So That's please awesome. do, and please do walk through this world thinking about how you can make things meaningful and better for children. I love that. Thank you so much, Karen. This was so insightful. Again, head on over www.hackmankind.com and join our support calls. Those support calls are only accessible to our members. However, right now we're offering a thousand memberships for free. The first 1000 people to sign up for our membership um, do not, uh, will have lifetime free access. So head on over and you will receive the link in, I've also posted it here on the Zoom for our members. So head on over there. We'll see you real soon at noon Eastern time. And uh, we'll see you Karen again next week at the same time. Thank you, Jessica. Have Thank a great you. day. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.